Welcome to Lifestyle Solopreneur, the community for entrepreneurs who put lifestyle first. Join your host, Flavia Barris, as she interviews successful lifestyle solopreneurs and shares ideas to help you find the perfect balance between lifestyle, business, and self. Flavia is an attorney, marketing expert, and founder of several online academies. She's been featured in major media, including BBC World News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ESPN Television, and more. Join us for this episode of Lifestyle Solopreneur. Hey, Lifestyle Solopreneurs. Today, we get to speak with Baydad Jamshidi. He started CJAM Marketing after realizing that most business owners don't know how to evaluate the value of a marketing agency or even assess their own needs. Since every business is different, not only in their needs, But where they are in the growth process, it really is not a one-size-fits-all process. In the past five years, B, for short, has met with and assessed 861 marketing agencies, even more than that at this point. And he's vetted them down to a lean 90 preferred partners across all marketing niches. After pairing hundreds of businesses with the right partners, he's found his skill set lies in the matchmaking process. He is featured in Market Watch, Bloomberg, National Post, and the Financial Post. His unique background in marketing, engineering, consulting, leadership, sales, and strategy has allowed him to serve as the conduit between business owners and the marketing teams they need. Welcome to the show, B. Thanks for having me. It's fabulous to have you here. And I think your niche or niche is unique because I don't know that I've interviewed anyone else who does exactly what you do. I'm not even sure I'm aware of someone out there who's doing this kind of matchmaking. So tell us a little bit about what is this need? What did you see out in the marketplace and what led you on this path? Yeah, no great questions. So I think it starts with my backstory a little bit where I'm actually an engineer. I used to do sales engineering and a whole bunch of other types of engineering, but specifically for a company very similar to Verizon, but up in Canada was called TELUS. And I worked on the B2B side of things. I was typically working with mid-sized companies, 50 to 1,000 type employee range, understanding like what's happening within the business from a C-level perspective, IT perspective, and then building out roadmaps of like, how do you get from A to B to C within an organization? And so I built this like skill set of business consulting, sales, leadership, and technology. And I got into marketing really randomly. I was basically started out building out websites, Google Ads, SEO for small businesses, and very quickly didn't like doing 80-hour websites on the weekend. And I was making a pretty solid six-figure salary as an engineer. So I started working with different marketing partners. And as I did that, I noticed that most marketing partners didn't really understand business. And most businesses didn't really understand marketing. And so I put these two people in the same meeting and they didn't speak the same language. Or agencies are really only good at one to three things typically, but they say they could do everything. And so I thought, what if I was able to be the bridge for that? And I'd find 10 marketing partners and solve all the world's problems. To this day, as you mentioned, uh, I've talked to 886 different marketing agencies and partners, work with about 11% of those in terms of in my vetted network. And I just connect businesses to the right marketing partners. And that's where I found the, the gaps in the market. You've invented your own industry in a way, because I, it's not like you can just model after someone who does exactly what you do. It's so easy in the world of business to say, hey, I want to do what that guy's doing or that gal's doing. They could be a mentor. I want to follow in their footsteps. But you were inventing this on your own. Yeah, this, that's the hard part of running this business is because there's no one to really model. There are like different types of businesses like Upwork and Fiverr and those guys, but they're marketplaces. And it's a little different than being like a marketing matchmaker because it's much more of a tailored type service. And there's a lot more vetting that kind of goes into it on my side. So it's like always trying to play around with the different models, figuring out what makes sense and finding the right balance for things. And it took me three and a half, four years to really figure that out. So is this a lifestyle business? I guess it's maybe under the umbrella of a type of consulting, right? But is this something that you would consider has improved your lifestyle compared to working as you used to in a more sort of traditional role? Or was it something that was a struggle at first to figure out what would your work week look like? What would your, you know, daily load of of tasks and things to do look like? Absolutely. The reason why I got into this business was because I wanted more of my time back is never really about money. I was making really good money as a sales engineer. For me, it's about getting time back. And in the beginning, it definitely was not a lifestyle business. There's a lot of work that went in because I did work two jobs. I worked as an engineer and running the business at the same time. So it was basically two jobs until I got to a certain point where I grew to the 
point where I could leave my full-time job and replace my salary and, and then some. And now I'm in a place where I'm constantly building. I have a team of about eight to nine contractors that work for me within my team. I really consider them part of the team. And it allows me to have a lot more time. If you look at the last two, three months of what we did, we had family visiting us for two straight months as we moved internationally and everyone wanted to visit us. We did Spain, we did Germany, France, Switzerland. I'm going to Vegas next week. Last weekend, I was in Belgium. A lot of travel that I wouldn't have been able to do if I was still working my full-time job while balancing the business and moving it forward, if that makes sense. That does make sense. And that's the dream for a lot of people is being geographically flexible where you can... And I think today, even if you work in sort of corporate America or for a big employer, you might have the ability to work remotely, but you generally don't have the ability to organize your schedule and calendar the way that's ideal for you and optimal and that you want because someone else owns your time and calls the shots and you're an employee. But for you, this flexibility must feel really good, but I'm sure that it goes beyond that. Tell us some of the stories of your clients. I know you have, we could probably spend 50 hours talking about client stories, mm -hmm. case studies, but maybe tell us a couple of stories just to let us know who is it that comes to you? How are you able to help them through some challenges and problems? Yeah, absolutely. There's many different types of customers that come, but some of them are basically serial business owners, people who own multiple different businesses and know the headache of finding the right marketing or development partner, depending on which business they're running. So one of my customers, for example, runs five different businesses and they're across so many different types of niches from e -com to a service-based company to an online pharmacy company. I've helped him source over nine different partners for his companies and typically they're done in less than a week. And so I actually got to meet him in Austin the last time I went for an event. And he's like, Baydad, you really just helped me avoid the dumb tax, which is basically the money that you pay till you find a good partner. Because most businesses, it takes them anywhere from three to five different tries just to find one good agency. And typically when you hire an agency, you're using them for three to six months before you let them go. And sometimes it could take you two, three years to figure out the right partner for the right channel. And I just helped them speed that up. And that's how he explained it to me. So it's fun having customers like that to work with. And I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that story because that's what it's all about, right? It's saving time, not just money. It's You don't want to waste efforts, but you definitely don't want to waste time because time is everything. It's that one resource we can't really get back. And I'm sure too, and this is just a guess and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when you have an agency that you've sent a lot of clients to because you made that match, you're the matchmaker, you brought them together, I'm pretty sure that agency has a lot of incentive not to screw up oh, and to absolutely. treat the client like gold because they know that if they don't, you're never going to send someone else again. That's exactly it. That's the biggest thing for me. Like when I'm going through my agency vetting process, like one of the key things that I hammer home, I'm like, it, you need to be very transparent with me because they pay to get into my network. And so there's that aspect of it because that's a filter. But then also if they say that they can do something and they don't deliver, I'm looking into it and I don't send customers to them in the future. It's always all about like just being transparent and honest, which is like the biggest values for me. And when you're talking about like saving time, for example, that, that same customer, he had five months because he is a pharmacist. There was a certain opportunity in the insurance realm in pharmacy where he had five months to make as much money as he could based on something that was in the market. And I matched him with three influencer companies, a copywriter that did conversion rate, optimized copy and a, and a landing page designer. And within those five months, I have them on video saying it, they netted $3 million from that incentive. And a lot of those partners he was able to get, like I said, underneath a week. And so there's like certain opportunities that like are just there. And if you have the right connections to find the right things at the right time, it could really help move that business forward. But you got an extra $3 million, you can invest it into your four other businesses, uh, I'd assume. There's people listening, wondering, do I need a matchmaker to help me find an agency? Do I even need an agency? Maybe they're doing everything in-house. Maybe they just hire freelancers. What size does a business need to be for it to be a good fit for the services you offer? It's a great question. I work with customers of all sizes, but typically the right fit is the ones that are in that scale mode where they need to get the right people in the right seats because they're moving to maybe their seven figures or low eight figures and they're trying to move up. Those are typically the best fit because they need three, four, five different types of partners. And it's really hard to find yourself. But I've worked with smaller businesses too, where they're like, look, Beta, we don't have a foundation. Like, how do we build out our website? How do we do some of our branding? Is there some SEO that we can get started with? Because we're thinking about things more long-term. So it really just depends on the business, their understanding of marketing, and if they have a budget to support. 
And if they have the right budget to support what their expectations are, I can typically help because I have partners of all sizes. And so if there's anyone that's listening who wants to be in your role, not just hire a company like yours, and maybe not be in your specific role, because you're a matchmaker in a very specific industry, but there's consultants in all kinds of industries who are the matchmakers for their mm-hmm. industry. There's a career in being that connector, that hub, the person who knows everybody and knows what's out there and knows everybody's reputation. That knowledge is super valuable. And for anyone listening, let's say you're an expert, it could be something niched down, right? It has to be special expertise. If you are already getting people calling you, asking for your advice, or opinion, or, hey, can I pick your brain on this? Because I know you're the person that knows a lot about it. There could be a career there, but tell us some of the like pros and cons of planting your flag and calling yourself and starting a venture where you're a consultant that is out there. It's just service-based and your main role is to make these connections between other people. What are the pros and cons of that career path? Yeah. So some of the pros obviously are like, you're not doing the execution work. So when it comes to you, you're talking to businesses, you're understanding them, which for me is like the real fun part and what I used to do at TELUS. And then when you're matching them, you're passing it off to a partner that's actually doing the execution work. So you don't have to do the execution work on that front where you're delivering the service. So that's like a big pro to me. Two is you can do this from anywhere in the world. And ultimately, if you like to connect with people and you like to network and do those types of things, it's a really good role to be in because that's basically all you do. When it comes to the con or the the negative aspects of it, you have to manage a lot of different relationships. You have to understand that those relationships are constantly changing, right? Because agency businesses or even fractional CMOs you work with, they're changing all the time. And so you need to be aware of that. The other aspects that are really hard is like you're matching personalities, right? You're matching the personality of a business and you're matching a personality of an agency together. And it's very much like matchmaking in a relationship. I don't know if anyone's ever watched matchmaking shows on TV, but you have to be able to match both the level of business and where they're at and their personality to really make that fit. And these businesses, as they're growing on both sides, they do break. And so you need to be aware of that as well. So those would be some of the pros and some of the cons. I could go on forever, but just some of the highlight aspects of it. And it's not a fully passive business either. There's still a lot of lead generation that you need to do, build out your own marketing. The eight to nine contractors I was talking about are people that work on my team to work on my marketing, my own brand. And most people know that one of the hardest aspects of business to dial in is your sales funnel and how to bring people in and business development, which most businesses don't like doing, but the most successful ones have that in place. You are probably someone that is in demand in a lot of different directions. I'm sure there's a lot of demands on your time and people are like, hey, you're a great consultant. Do you want to come in-house with us? Can we just hire you full-time? Can you take on this role, that role? And part of maintaining your lifestyle, I'm sure, is setting boundaries and learning to say no. What are some ways that you maintain your sanity, white space in your calendar? I know you travel a lot, so I don't know if right now you're traveling more than you'd like optimally or if that's something that's like right now at the perfect level. But tell us about your work-life balance, your lifestyle, and how you manage all of that. Absolutely. There's so much that could be said for this aspect. So some of the things, for example, is that I'm really focused on not moving the flag. A lot of people, let's say their goal like was to hit twenty or $30,000 a month. And as soon as they get to that, they go, my next goal is 50 to 60. And then they hit that and they're like, my next goal is 100. And it's just this chase for money not really knowing why. For me, that's like never really the case. Like I hit some pretty crazy numbers last year. And this year, I didn't change my goals. They're actually half the goals of what I hit last year. Because I was like, this is what I need to sustain the business is what I need to sustain my lifestyle. And even when I hit that goal, about four months into this year, I didn't increase that goal. I just said everything else is considered a surplus. And next year, my goal will be around the same as it was this year. I know people talk about if you're not growing, you're dying and all that different type of stuff. But I don't fully agree with that kind of mentality because then you're always chasing. And I think the people that become the most comfortable in life and most fulfilled in life realize that it's not just about money and business. There's family, there's friends, there's the vacationing aspect. And there's other things that really matter to me, which is really community. And when I, like you said, I get asked on for a lot of different things and I do sprints for my business. And so I say in Q3, we're focusing on this. In Q4, we're going to focus on something different. 
And if there's any other ideas that we add to it, those get added to a list and then they get prioritized and pushed forward if they really matter. And if they don't, we just leave them on the list until it makes sense to go at them. So that's to answer the first two questions. On the travel side, the last two years, because I left my full-time job two years ago almost now, it's been a learning and balance of like how much travel to do. I had, when we were living in Vancouver, it was easier to drive, fly to the US and go to events and conferences. But now that we live internationally, international travel is hard. For example, in March, I did two trips to the US uh, and I was like, all right, never doing that again because the jet lag is so brutal to deal with. And so I'm trying to find out the right balance for that. And then during the summer, this summer, we had so many people visiting us. And uh, although we love family, we love having them around, it really does slow business around. So it's always just like a conscious thing of figuring out what works, what doesn't work, reflecting on it, and then iterating on it in the future to find the, the better balance. But yeah, it's been quite a journey and it's been quite fun at the same time. So what are some of the goals that you're excited about? It could be personal or business or something on your personal bucket list coming up in the next couple of years. What are you building towards? And uh, maybe everyone listening, we can all just send you good vibes. Yeah, make that happen. We, we're behind you. We, we wish you well on that journey. Yeah, I always had a roadmap. So my goal was leave TELUS when I was making as much or more running my business at CJAM. And I already passed that. And then the goal was to get CJAM to a place where it's a little bit more automated. So it takes a little bit less of my time, even that it does currently. So getting one or two of the right people in the right seats in the company. And once that kind of gets played, maybe even next year, I want to start taking some coaching training because I just love learning and I read a lot of books and I have different counselors and I have different business coaches. And just naturally, I love to just coach and help people through hard times. And so I was like, as I'm running my company, I could also take on one or two coaching clients. But before doing that, I'd love to get trained on it, like legitimately, rather than just doing it naturally and build like systems and processes around that. Because I think that would be something that also helps fulfill me in a different way. And it's like how I built CJAM initially. I worked at Telus full time while building up my business. And now I'm doing that same kind of thing. We're getting CJAM to a place where it can run a little bit more automatedly with humans. I don't ever plan on bringing AI or software really to do the matchmaking because I don't think that works. But once I get the right people in place, doing a little bit more coaching and giving back on, on the other front. One of the fun things about being an entrepreneur, in my opinion, right, this is just opinion, is we get to name stuff. We get to name products and services and company names because that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur. You're creating something from scratch sometimes. So the name of your company is CJ Marketing. And I'm guessing the jam part comes from your last name, right? Yeah. Where does C come? So tell us, like, how did you come up with CJ as your name? It's like naming a kid when you get to name your company. Yeah, we went this about this the easiest way possible. But initially, when I started the company, it was with a friend of mine that was working at TELUS at the same time, older than I was. And he initially brought me onto this idea of, hey, there's a guy uh, making $50,000 a month doing SEO. And at the time, I had no idea what SEO was and how this guy was making $50,000 a month passively. Spoiler alert, not true. It was not fully passive. But anyways, it got me into the world. And we both like thought, hey, let's just start this marketing business and see how it goes. Maybe we can do the same thing that the other guy was doing. And so his last name started with a C. And obviously my last name is Jamshidi. So we just put the two together. And he only stayed in the company for about three to four months initially. And then he said, hey, B, I, this is just not aligned with what I want to do long term. But I think you could run it and you can do what you can do. It. Spoiler alert as well. At that time, I didn't think I could do it. But here we are five years later. And so that's how it happened. And I've just kept the name because it was just a, a good reminder of how it all started. And it's just more of a sentimental thing for me at this point. Makes sense. Yeah, because CJAM, you could have changed it to BJAM, but it nope. makes sense. CJAM, <laughs> you want to stay consistent with your branding because you know better than anyone. Branding, marketing, consistency is important too. So that's a great yeah. story. So anything else you want to share? Anything that you want to express to listeners to inspire them on their journeys? Some of us are starting businesses. Others are on the path on business, but maybe overworked, trying to find more flexibility in their schedule and more passion and purpose. What advice do you have for the people who are entrepreneurs, but maybe just need some fresh inspiration, but also people who wish that they can dive into that world of entrepreneurship, but for whatever reason have been held back? Absolutely. For the entrepreneurs and people that are already running their businesses, as we all know, there's always going to be ups and downs. So you always have to see it in terms of waves. 
and never make decisions at the bottom of the wave because you just have to ride it out and you will go back up. And the best decisions you will make are at the top. And just to know that all of those negative emotions that you go through, whether it's imposter syndrome, anxiety, or all those other types of things, those are part of the process. And without those emotions, you won't be able to feel joy and happiness and fulfillment either. They actually work hand in hand. I consider them kind of twins and you can't shut one down. They both actually grow together. And so work through those hard times and you'll feel more and more fulfilled as you go through them. And this is something that I keep in mind as I build out my businesses, because you're never going to be perfect, but you're always improving and trying to make things better. So that would be the advice that I have for people already running their businesses and people that are thinking about starting something new or or testing things out. I think you're in like one of the best positions possible. If you have a full-time job and it's paying you and you're in a comfortable position, find what you're passionate about. And you might not know what you're passionate about, but when you start things, just ask yourself, what would I like to do? And just start that thing. That's whether it's building a community, whether it's starting a, an Instagram channel or a TikTok channel, talking about a certain thing, just start. And if it doesn't work, that's fine. Like you'll pick up new skills and you can apply it to something else in the future. And you don't have to make your passion your job right from the beginning either. It took me three and a half years before I had to leave my full-time job because the business was growing at a point where it made sense to jump. I know a lot of people that just jump a little bit too early and then they put so much pressure on this thing that they really enjoy doing that it doesn't become fun anymore. And so that's the advice I have is just don't rush it, but find things that you like doing and just start doing them on your weekend or in the evenings and treat it as a game and see how that works out. Amazing advice. And you also have a little freebie gift for people listening. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Absolutely. I've vetted so many different agencies. So I obviously one of the the best gifts that I could give is the questions that I ask agencies. So I do have an agency audit guide that you can take. It's a high level one. There's 16 questions that you can use to ask marketing agencies because I've noticed most businesses don't go into those meetings prepared. And just having these questions will help you be more prepared so you can dive deeper into questions that you may have never asked. And then you'd be able to compare more apples to apples when you're evaluating marketing agencies. And you can find that in, I think, the show notes. Or if you go to the CJAM marketing website, if you go to the footer section, there's a resource section and you can grab the high level interview cheat sheet down there. And your website is at CJAM. So CJAMmarketing.com. So C-J-A-M-M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G.com. And there's the resources tab. We're also going to post the link in the podcast guest gift vault, which is at podcastguestgift.com, podcastguestgift.com, where listeners can access not just your freebie, but all the freebies that our wonderful guests are very generously providing, which is great. So B, you know what? You are very inspiring because two years ago, you had just like typical job. And now you've created this entire I, I'm going to say more than just a company. It's like its own industry, right? You're one of the pioneers in doing this kind of matchmaking because there's not a lot of people doing what you're doing. And you're not just doing it, you're doing it really well at a really just amazing level of skill. So thank you for all that you do and also for coming on today and inspiring us. Yeah, and thanks for having me. And I hope what we shared helps uh, other people in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. And if you leave a review on iTunes, I promise I will read every single review. If you know someone who makes a full-time living from part-time work, and maybe this is you, please visit lifestylesolopreneur.com to nominate a guest or to nominate yourself. Because remember this, money doesn't buy happiness. But money in the hands of a happy person, there is no greater tool. Today's episode was brought to you by the Get Shift Done program. It's a lifestyle changing online class to help you define your business and lifestyle ambitions and to set goals in a way you've never experienced before. This class will 10x your daily productivity with methods that will blow your mind. And if you use the coupon code podcast, The class tuition is 99% off. Visit GetShiftDone.com to enroll today.